Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jazz Atwal. I'm the Deputy Chief Provincial Public Health Officer for Manitoba. Tuesday morning, reduced public health restrictions came into effect. It's been a while since we have been in a place where we would consider easing public health restrictions. Looking at the data, we monitor things such as hospitalizations, ICU numbers, the test positivity rate, vaccination rates, available modeling, and other relevant data. We are seeing that this was the right time to implement some carefully considered changes. We have been and continue to head in a very good direction in relation to the impacts of COVID-19 on Manitobans and its impacts on the healthcare system. As Dr. Rusin stated last week, to be effective, public health measures should only be as restrictive as they need to be at the time. As the pandemic changed, as the virus changed, our approach has changed as well. We are actively monitoring the trends, data, and surveillance to determine our next steps with the goal of continuing to reduce restrictions over the long term and into the spring. One of the key tools to the reduction of public health orders is vaccination. Increasing vaccination is one way we can continue to keep ourselves and each other safe in the months ahead. Many Manitobans have stepped up and followed the rules and chosen to be vaccinated. The importance of that cannot be understated. We know that public health orders are not meant to stay in place forever, that we need to learn to live with the virus. Reducing the public health orders this week is a step in the right direction. Manitobans are reminded that COVID-19 treatment options are available for eligible patients. Please remember, treatment does not replace vaccination, but treatments are available. Early testing is key as treatment must begin within five to seven days of symptoms developing. Manitobans are encouraged to seek testing as soon as symptoms develop and to contact their healthcare provider, doctor or health links InfoSant if they meet the minimum eligibility criteria. You need to meet the criteria of one of the following groups. Group one, if you are greater than 40 years of age and not fully immunized and have no history of COVID-19. Group two, you are 18 to 40 years of age and are not fully immunized and have no history of COVID and have one of the following conditions, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, lung disease, renal disease, liver disease, significant mental health disorders, or if you are obese or if you are a smoker. Group three, you are greater than 18 years of age, regardless of your immunization status, and if you are either immune compromised or immune suppressed. Group four, you are indigenous and greater than 40 years of age and have more than four months post your second dose and either have not had a third dose or it has been less than 14 days since your third dose and have any one of the following conditions, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, lung disease, renal disease, liver disease, significant mental health disorders, or if you are obese, or if you are a smoker. Group five, you are non-Indigenous and greater than 50 years of age, and are more than four months post your second dose, and either have not had a third dose, or it has been less than 14 days since your third dose, and have any one of the following conditions. Diabetes, cancer, heart disease, lung disease, renal disease, liver disease, significant mental health disorders, or you are obese or you are a smoker. Again, early testing is key as treatment must begin within five to seven days of symptoms developing. I have just mentioned a number of chronic illnesses that increases one's risk of a severe outcome. Having any one of those conditions increases your risk of a severe outcome. Having more than one condition increases your risk even greater. Please ensure you are aware of your risk and get tested as soon as possible if symptoms develop. And if you test positive, contact your healthcare provider and access treatment if available. For more information, visit the treatment page on the Manitoba COVID-19 website. While my NFL team is not playing again this Sunday, some of you might be planning to celebrate Super Bowl 56 with friends or family. Public Health recommends that everyone attending a gathering self-screen for symptoms using the COVID-19 screening tool before attending in person, stay home if you are sick, even if symptoms are mild, frequently clean and disinfect commonly touched services, don't share utensils or condiments, 
Consider having one individual designated to serve guests food to reduce the sharing of utensils. More guidance on gatherings can be found under celebration information on the Manitoba COVID-19 website. Thank you, and I will now pass it over to Dr. Reimer. Thank you, Dr. Atwell. I'm Dr. Joss Reimer, medical lead on the province's vaccine task force. As Manitoba's COVID-19 vaccine campaign continues to roll out, many people still have questions about the safety of the COVID-19 vaccines, both in the short and in the long term. I hear these questions and concerns all the time. I see them on social media, and it is normal to have questions. The good news is that scientists have been testing the COVID-19 vaccine since 2020, and they've found, for starters, that serious side effects are very rare. And together uh, with what we know about other vaccines and the immune system, if side effects are going to occur, they usually happen in the days to weeks after getting a vaccine. This is why international medical regulators, including Health Canada, require the first few months of safety data before approving new vaccines. This, plus information coming from vaccine recipients all around the world since the rollout began, gives us confidence that the COVID-19 vaccines are safe. In fact, most side effects occur within the first one or two days after getting a vaccine. And most of them are minor, things like pain at the injection site, fatigue, or fever which are signs that your immune system is building a response against the virus that you've been vaccinated against. Billions of people have received a COVID-19 vaccine. Given the sheer number of vaccines administered to date, common, uncommon, and rare side effects would have been detected by now. It's very unlikely that researchers will be surprised by new information on side effects this far along in the vaccine rollout globally. We've also seen some people raise concerns online about mRNA vaccines, such as the Pfizer uh, vaccine being a new technology. But mRNA or messenger RNA is found in all living cells. mRNA is a message or a recipe card that tells cells how to make proteins. In this case, uh, the proteins made will trigger an immune response inside the body. That immune response is what protects us against infection if a person is exposed to the virus. Messenger RNA is not the same as DNA. It's not the same as your genes. It can't combine with your DNA to change your genetic code. Messenger, vac messenger RNA vaccines do not affect or interact with your DNA. So we can be assured there'll be no long-term DNA altering effects from these vaccines. What's more, uh, checking the safety of the vaccines doesn't stop after they've been registered for use. Once a vaccine has been introduced, ongoing monitoring of its safety is a crucial part of the vaccine development process. And it's really remarkable that we have these systems because they don't exist for any other prescription drugs, over-the-counter medications, naturopathic treatments, vitamins, supplements, or any other treatment that we use on our bodies. Canada has a robust system for this ongoing monitoring. The system was established to detect any unexpected side effects from vaccines if they occur and ensure that they're investigated promptly. This type of monitoring is standard practice in Canada for vaccines. The data on the COVID-19 vaccination collected in these surveillance system systems is published regularly on Health Canada's website. So while we would not know if something like tea tree oil is harming people until the harms were massive. This system should reassure Manitobans that if there's a new serious vaccine side effect, we will know about it, we will communicate it, and we will act on it quickly. And unlike the risk of contracting COVID-19 and, and being sick for a long time and potentially having long-term side effects, the vaccines are highly unlikely to go on to cause long-term effects. Science also shows us that for any vaccine, including COVID-19, uh, that the most serious side effects do occur within the first few weeks. Some who are still unsure about the vaccines may feel that they're too new and that we don't know whether or not they could tr trigger life-threatening or unexpected side effects 
perhaps months or years after getting the vaccine. One example uh, is some misinformation that I've seen circulating about UK surveillance data recently. The UK reported that vaccinated people had a lower level of one type of antibody after infection compared to unvaccinated people. This is being spread to wrongly argue that the vaccines weaken our immune system, when in fact this is great news. Antibody levels are typically lower with mild disease, and they're higher the sicker that somebody gets. So the reason that the UK saw lower antibody levels after infections in vaccinated people is because they had milder symptoms. They simply were not as sick as people who received the infect who were infected uh, without being vaccinated. On the question of whether these vaccines could cause long-term effects, that's really not how vaccines work and not how our bodies work. Vaccines are not the same as other medications. Unlike many medications, which might be taken daily, vaccines are received very infrequently. Medicine that you take every day can cause side effects that reveal themselves over time. And that includes long-term problems as levels of the drug build up in the body and as the damage caused uh, over time can accumulate. And this can mean that over months to years, you can get different side effects. But vaccines work by having their entire impact occur almost immediately. And then they are quickly eliminated by the body. This is true with the messenger RNA vaccines. mRNA degrades rapidly you wouldn't expect any of these vaccines to have any longer term side effects. There are side effects that we see early on uh, and that's it. The big reason that scientists are not worried about long-term effects is because our bodies can't do that. So regardless of what triggers our body to create an immune response, it doesn't have the ability to later in life start up again with a new response. The immune system will respond to the infection or the vaccine that triggered it and then it settles back into waiting for the next infection. It does not reactivate with harms years later. If it did, every bacterial infection, every virus, every cold that you've ever had could potentially cause surprise long-term effects. Thankfully, none of these do that because our bodies simply can't do that. But any risk can be frightening, especially for a parent. The risk of rare side effects identified with COVID vaccines have to be weighed against the known and much higher risks of contracting a COVID infection. It's not yet clear how variants such as Omicron may affect patients long-term, but what we do know is that the risk of severe outcomes from contracting COVID are by far more concerning than the potential for temporary and mild side effects from the vaccine. I would also like to highlight some of the latest guidance from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, which we are adopting here in Manitoba. NACI recommends that if you have been infected with COVID-19, that you should wait two to three months after the infection before getting your next dose of the vaccine. This new guidance comes after millions of Canadians became infected over a period of weeks uh, following the emergence of Omicron in our communities. NACI has indicated that a longer interval between infection and vaccination uh, might result in a better immune response as it allows time for the immune response to mature and for circulating antibodies to degree, decrease before being triggered again. So the two to three month window between infection and vaccination uh, may give the body, the immune system, enough time to return to baseline. And hopefully this will then maximize the response of your next dose. So in Manitoba, we support this clinical guidance, but we also know that we don't yet have clear data on the best timing of COVID-19 vaccine after COVID-19 infection. The NACI advice uh, was built using the basic principles and medical knowledge of immunology in general. So as more information becomes available, this guidance might change. If you have been infected with COVID-19, I wanna be very clear that you are still recommended to get your next dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. We have overwhelming data showing how well these vaccines work to protect you. We have very little data, however, on how well and for how long an infection prevents, pre prevents protects you. Also, 
We have data showing that getting the vaccine after an infection creates a strong immune response and increases your protection. So please don't assume that you are protected after an infection. We do know that infection does provide some protection, but please get your next dose to be as protected as possible, whether that's your first, your second, or your booster dose. NACI suggests that you wait two to three months, but if you do have a reason that you should go sooner, that's okay too. So thank you for your time today, and we will open up to questions. Thank you, doctors. A reminder to our reporters on this Zoom session, you will have one preliminary and one follow-up question. Up first this afternoon from CJOB, Skyler. Hi, doctors, thanks for taking our questions. Uh, I think Dr. Owl, this is probably best suited for you, but either of you feel free to, uh, to answer this one. As we see some jurisdictions really start to loosen up on their restrictions, such as Saskatchewan and Alberta, I'm wondering what impact that has on uh, the process that our public health officials take here. I know everyone's kind of running their own race, um, but I'm sure certainly you're monitoring what other jurisdictions are doing at the same time. So from a public health perspective, we just changed our orders yesterday. Uh, and, you know, those are in place for two weeks time. We monitor our situation here in Manitoba. We look at what our risk is. We look at what our impacts are on our acute care system. We take our population into account there as well. Of course, we look at what's happening in other jurisdictions and what the impact there is in those jurisdictions as well. So again, there's a number of different indicators we look at. Uh, just because one province is doing something doesn't mean we're necessarily going to do that. We'll look at that. We'll see if that is... Uh, uh, feasible in Manitoba as well, but we continue to look at the evidence that we have and we have to look at what we have from a capacity standpoint to uh, look at what we recommend from a public health perspective. And we're going to continue to do that as well. Great, thanks for that. And Dr. Reimer, the first dose numbers uh, over the last couple of weeks, I guess, are, are uh, a little surprising, uh, I think, in, in the right direction. Like there was 688 recorded uh, yesterday, which I think is a pretty good number at this stage in the pandemic. Could you maybe give us a snapshot of who these people are that are uh, choosing to get first doses at this time and, and what maybe brought them to that decision uh, as vaccines have been available for almost a year now? Well, I think for some people, um, that really builds on what I was talking about um, today in that they wanted to see how things went. They were nervous with this being a new vaccine and wanted to see the effects that uh, the vaccine had on the community, on their friends, their families. Uh, and now that they've seen the, the safety profile and that these continue to be effective and safe vaccines, many people feel more comfortable moving forward. And so that's wonderful to see anytime that someone feels uh, that this is the best um, next step for them. You know, we're, we're really excited to welcome them to get that first dose. Some of them are also kids as well. We have the vaccine has only been available since uh, the end of November for kids who are five to 11. So that age group is also still um, increasing their first doses uh, as they've only had uh, a couple months to be able to get that. Um, and then I think that there's some folks as well who might be new to Manitoba um, or um, uh, are because of a new employment or something like that, there's new requirements on them. And so you do have individuals who, because of um, new situations in their own lives, may be choosing to get the vaccine. I am hopeful also that if Novavax be, is approved by Health Canada, that we'll see um, a number of people come forward to get that one as well, because it does use um, a technology that we're more used to in, in the vaccine world. And so because it's not a messenger RNA, there may be some people who feel that it's a better option for them. And so I'm certainly hopeful that if that does get approved, that we'll see numbers go up again. From the Winnipeg Sun, Ryan. Oh, um, I just, this is a question for uh, Dr. Reimer. I mean, you mentioned uh, two to three months uh, after uh, getting infected with COVID to get your uh, another dose? Does that matter between whether it's between first and second or second or third or even third and fourth at all? 
the NASI guidance does go into more detail uh, about when what the time interval is, depending on which dose it is. So they do recommend uh, two months if you're talking about your first or second dose and three months if you're talking about a booster dose. Um, I mean, this is all based on um, what we know about the immune response in general and not specific to uh, information that we have about COVID-19. So in Manitoba, we wanted to make it as, as easy to understand as possible for individuals. Uh, and so we're just saying, you know, two to three months for most people is very reasonable. Um, and if you do have a specific reason that you need to go sooner, um, like what I was just talking about, perhaps there's some um, requirement at your place of employment, uh, that that uh, is, is reasonable as well to, to go earlier. But two to three months is the, the general recommendation from NASI and Manitoba thinks that that's reasonable. Okay, thanks. And uh, I guess this one's for Dr. Atwal. Um, you know, similar to Skylar's question, um, do you think dropping uh, proof of vaccination requirements at this stage of the game in Manitoba uh, would be a prudent move? Again, we're going to look at the situation. We're going to look at our data. Uh, um, you know, we're not speculating on the orders today. They were just changed yesterday. Um, so we're going to continue to work on this from a public health perspective. And, uh, you know, once things are recommended and finalized, obviously that will be provided to the public as well. From CBC Radio Canada, Emil. Hi there. I was just wondering, um, due to protests that are still going on for uh, six days, um, outside of the legislature, have any weight in your decisions considering health measures? No, uh, you know, I, I think people have had uh, opinions about how um, the pandemic has gone. You know, we've had other protests in the past. Uh, um, and, and, you know, this isn't about protests. This is about Manitobans who have done what they've been asked to do. You know, the vast majority of people have followed the orders. The vast majority of Manitobans have gotten a vaccine. And that's basically why we're in the position we're in right now where we could loosen things. You know, the virus has changed. The risk has decreased compared to Delta because of Omicron. But we still have our acute care system to worry about. But things are improving there as well. You know, our numbers are coming down from a hospitalization standpoint. Our numbers are coming down from an ICU standpoint. And, and, and there's less transmission happening in the community. So, again, I want to thank all Manitobans. I want to thank all Canadians for doing what public health has asked them to do. You've put us in a position to be in where we're at right now, where we can continue to look at lessening the restrictions. Public health wants zero restrictions on anyone. That, you know, we do this because we have to do it to protect our healthcare system at the present time, and we are loosening those restrictions. We just loosened them uh, yesterday, uh, and we're going to continue to look at that data, look at that information as well to continue to have the least amount of restrictions on individuals. Balancing risk, we have to understand the impacts of these orders and other sectors, not just the healthcare system as well, and we take that into account as well. So, again, you know, thank you, Manitobans, for doing what you've done to be able to make us in this, be able to put us into this position, so we can make uh, some further uh, loosening recommendations as time goes on, as it permits. Thank you for that. And are you considering to go as far and as quickly as other provinces when it will be the time to uh, loosen the restrictions even more? Again, you know, I, I can't speculate what our next set of recommendations will be. We had a meeting on it this morning. We'll continue to have daily meetings on this as well. We have conversations every day looking at that data as it comes in. And again, we want the least amount of restrictions to be on Manitobans. Uh, we've used different tools in our toolbox uh, to put on restrictions, and we'll look at those same tools to take restrictions off as well on Manitobans. From CBC Manitoba, Ian. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Atwal, you, you mentioned the data that sort of backs up these decisions to loosen restrictions, but, you know, we haven't seen the wastewater modeling. We, we aren't seeing modeling that shows us that these restrictions won't result in, you know, disastrous outcomes in, in hospitals. Um, I mean, can you, can you provide more of that data? Can you uh, I guess, give us more more confidence that these decisions are backed by science and evidence? 
we, so we have lots of science and evidence and indicators pointing that we're heading in the right direction. We can look at providing future modeling slides as well in relation to what to expect uh, going forward as well. I mean, from a wastewater perspective, we know that wastewater is showing less activity now than it did two or three weeks ago. When we look at our case numbers and using proxies for cases, we have data where there's less cases being generated in different institutions and, and different businesses in Manitoba on a week to week basis over the past several weeks. You know, our test positive case numbers are coming down as well. The percentage of individuals being admitted to the hospitals being reduced with COVID. And after a chart review, even those who actually are admitted for COVID, who have COVID, who are there because of COVID, that percentage is decreasing as well, same as the ICU as well. From a, a perspective of when hospitalizations peaked, they probably peaked about 15, 16 days ago. From a, a standpoint where ICU prevalence peaked, it would have been about 10 days ago as well. So we are seeing that decline. Uh, there's a number of different indicators showing that. There's less absenteeism in workplaces as well. There's a number of different indicators and, and uh, data sets that we use to look at what the risk is for Manitobans. And again, you know, we use that to come up with where we felt recommendations should be. And that's what we did uh, as of yesterday, uh, yesterday morning. And we'll continue to look at that to see what our next set of recommendations will be as well. Sorry, thank you. Uh, you also said that uh, you know the, the protests outside the legislature grounds is not influencing the public health decisions. But are you concerned that you know by loosening restrictions like what happened yesterday, that it may be perceived as you know bowing down to to their requests? You know, that's something I uh, haven't considered. Uh, that's something I haven't thought about. I mean, I think from a protest standpoint, the way protests can happen, I think people have a right to voice an opinion. There's a right and wrong way of doing it. Um, um, I mean, protests can also cause public health harm. And I mean, there are orders here to follow to help mitigate risk. Again, I, I think we're, we, Manitobans have done a heck of a lot. Let's talk about the vast majority of Manitobans who've done what we've asked them to do and continue to do what we've asked them to do. They've stepped up from a, uh, an orders perspective, from a messaging perspective, from testing to, to limiting contacts, to getting vaccinated and accessing treatment if, if they're uh, available to access that treatment. So, you know, again, the vast majority of people have done what we've asked them to do. And, and I think we're going to continue to focus on what's best for Manitobans. Uh, uh, individuals who protest or a handful of individuals who protest have no bearing on what public health recommends. Uh, and, and that's as simple as that. From the Canadian press, Steve. Hi, Dr. Atwal. Uh, you, you talked about a lot of the indicators and I know that uh, generally uh, the last of the lagging indicators is, is uh, the, the number of deaths. And I know we're uh, revealing a, a dozen new deaths uh, today alone. Uh, do you expect that number to drop very soon? And can you comment on you know, a dozen in a day is pretty high and, and nationally looking at the stats compiled by the federal government, we still seem to be having a high number of, of uh, deaths recorded across the country. Yeah, so there's, you know, lagging indicators, like I think our ICU numbers will still be high, don't get me wrong, they are trending in the right direction, but they're going to be high and it'll take probably about eight weeks to kind of get down to a nadir where there might be only 10 or 15 people in ICU because of COVID. I, I, and, you know, deaths continue to lag as well. And sometimes that's just a matter of uh, how information comes in, whether it's a medical examiner report that comes in, you know, there was a postmortem that was a, a test positive versus not. Uh, there's a lot of transmission out there as well uh, in relation to COVID. 19 as well. So there might be some incidental COVID-19 infections that are being uh, calculated or counted in that as well. Um, so, you know, I, I think over time, uh, deaths will decrease, uh, uh, but it will be a lagging indicator. It'll take a little bit of time for that to occur. And th there's, of course, ongoing concern about the number of uh, surgical procedures and diagnostic tests that have had to be cancelled and uh, the number of patients that have to be transferred uh, between regions of the province, within the province, um, to free up bed space. So can you give us some indication as to how the loosening of restrictions and the slower loosening that we're seeing in Manitoba, uh, how that might impact hospital capacity and the need to delay uh, procedures? So, you know, I, first I want to thank all the healthcare providers for um, doing what they've done during the pandemic and during what they've done during the present wave to um, help
help us navigate Manitoba through this difficult situation, right? We had increased number of hospitalizations. Uh, we've had increased uh, burden on healthcare workers. We have increased ICE use with this current wave as well. Uh, to all the Manitobans who had their surgeries canceled, procedures canceled, um, you know, that was because we had a lot of people who had COVID-19. And we knew that was going to happen, and we had to shift our response. and And the system met that challenge. It, it sacrificed. It had to. Uh, it had to really triage some services. And, and and you know, again, we want to thank the system for doing that. We want to thank Manitobans for doing that. I want to apologize for you know delaying those procedures and de delaying those uh, uh, diagnostics that had to get delayed. You know, as our case numbers. Are, are dropping down, you know, as the amount of uh, um, infection out there is diminishing, that'll have less impacts on our hospitalizations and less impacts on our ICU numbers, which in turn will help um, allow for those procedures to return back to hopefully a baseline level. So a recovery mode basically will occur on the acute care side to be able to get back into those activities. I know there's lots of work being done on that right now. I, I'm not heavily involved on that side. We hear information from the shared health side. Uh, so shared health could provide a lot more detail on that recovery and the recovery plan going forward as well. From CTV Winnipeg, Michelle. Hi, Dr. Atwell. I wanted to ask a little bit about timelines for reopening. Um, the last time we've done it, you know, we've kind of had a couple weeks of three or four weeks, one or two infection cycles. Uh, but would the timeline be accelerated at all? I know we've mentioned spring. Uh, is that early spring, late spring, or, and what could potentially accelerate it? It's again, it's really hard to predict that future. Uh, we're looking at this on a daily basis. Our orders are set to expire in uh, 13 days now. Um, uh, so those are in effect for 13 days. Again, we're going to continue to look at, um, you know, that transition of having restrictions in place to lessening those restrictions. And again, we're going to look at all the data that we have, and we're going to try to make the best decisions for Manitoba to ensure that Manitobans have the least amount of restrictions on them. And again, not to overwhelm our acute care system. So I, I, it's really hard for me to predict two year, two months down the road. We're, we're dealing here with day to day, week to week, and how an order cycle right now would be two weeks. So I would look at it in two week increments at this point to see how the orders change. Thank you. And I just wanted to ask specifically about mask mandates. You know, we've we've seen Alberta and Saskatchewan set dates that they want to lift the mask mandate by. You, what is behind that strategy and would is that oh, I guess like everything's on the table, but is that um, a feasible thing that Manitobans could expect to come with relaxing of restrictions? Sure, uh, you know I can't comment on what the other provinces have chosen to do on, on the particular reason why. Again, you know we we had a mask, we have a mask mandate in place. It is a tool that we've used in public health to help mitigate risk, and obviously that tool at some point will uh, will not be there as long as that risk is, is alleviated or lessened. And, and I think that's what we're striving toward, to get Manitoba back to a quotation marks new normal, where we learn to live with a COVID-19 virus in circulation. And, and that's what we're striving to do. I think that's what we're going to continue to uh, pursue as well. From the Winnipeg Free Press, Katie. Good afternoon, Dr. Atwell. You've been asked a few times now about our Western neighbors lifting restrictions. You spoke about looking at Manitoba's own needs and capacity as you consider what other jurisdictions are doing, but what impact would it have on public health here in Manitoba if we were to drop vaccine and mask mandates now? So, you know, dropping mandates right off the bat would have an impact on the amount of transmission that likely occur out there. I don't think there's a real good model to show how much of an impact that would be. Uh, so again, you know, we have to look at where our risk is. We, we gradually had put in restrictions and different types of restrictions and use different types of tools. Again, we'll have to look at gradually removing those restrictions on Manitobans and POV will be one of those things as well. Not at the present time, but we are looking at that and understanding what potentially might those impacts be. So again, everything's on the table. Uh, we aren't speculating on the future, uh, uh, but we are taking this in, in, in essentially two week cycles at the present time. And again, when further uh, decisions are made, recommendations are made, we will provide that to the public. 
Okay. You also mentioned the need for people who are at higher risk of severe infections to get tested as soon as possible. Why not expand public access to PCR testing at this point? You know, PCR testing is available. Uh, uh, rapid antigen testing is available as well. What we're looking at here is trying to find those individuals who are at higher risk, you know, and, and try to identify them. Sometimes a rapid antigen test is actually the most, the best way to, uh, to facilitate that because it is much easier to provide to people in all areas of Manitoba as well. And, and so, so PCR has a tool. We continue to use PCR with the parameters that we set for it because that's where the greatest utility is. We have rapid antigen tests available as well. And we're, we're going to transition here. We are transitioning here to a test and treat uh, um, sort of scenario where if you are at higher risk, again, a lot of people I think don't realize they're at higher risk. If you're a smoker, you're at higher risk of having a severe outcome from COVID-19. Uh, if you're a 30-year-old diabetic, you're at higher risk of having a severe outcome from COVID-19. Uh, you know, if you, if you have an underlying heart or lung condition or a renal condition or a liver condition, you are at higher risk of having COVID-19. And the greater number of these conditions you have, the greater the risk that you have. So these individuals, you know, uh, need to be aware of their health status, be aware, need to, they need to be aware of what puts them at risk. And if they do get sick, you know, they should get tested and see if they qualify for treatment as well. I think that's very important here. That's how we're going to mitigate the risks related to COVID-19. That is the direction that we're heading. And I think that's the best way to help prevent severe outcomes as well, considering everything that we've gone through to this point. So people need to be aware of their health status. And because you're a 30-year-old and you're a smoker, that does put you at higher risk. So I think people need to realize their risk status, even with one lifestyle condition or one medical condition that puts them at higher risk. And that's why we went through all that today in relation to these different groups of individuals should seek testing and treatment if they develop symptoms. And I, I would want the, the media to really push this out to everyone. It should be in print. People should be reading about this. So it really hits home. It hits home to every Manitoban who accesses social media, accesses a paper, hears it on the news that these are the conditions and these are the parameters that put me at higher risk. I, I'm aware. Now, if I get sick, I'll go get tested right away because I have a five to seven day window and I'll be able to access treatment. So I, I think that's really important right now. From Global News, Abigail. Hi there. I'm just wondering if you have numbers in regards to how many Manitobans have used COVID treatment since it's become available. So the exact numbers could be provided by Shared Health. Uh, at this point, we have Paxlovid available, which is an antiviral medication. Uh, we had about 1,100 doses. We've used just about 100 of those at this point, 100 treatment uh, uh, prescriptions of it, sorry. Uh, on the Citrovimab, that's an anti-monoclonal uh, antibody that's available as well. And I believe we have 150 doses left, but we could uh, ask our comms to provide you with exact numbers after reaching out to Shared Health in relation to that as well. Okay, that'd be great, thanks. Um, and just on a happier note here, I know you kind of touched a little bit earlier about um, maybe reaching a peak a little bit. So how hopeful should Manitobans uh, be that we're hopefully going to start to see a downward trend in cases? So, so I, I think we've already, you know, I think cases peaked a few weeks ago. Uh, um, you know, we have continued to see a downward trend. We're, we're looking at cases differently than what we have in the past because we aren't testing everyone. So I understand that, but there's other proxies that we use to look at how much virus is out there. Our hospitalization numbers are coming down as well. And they probably peaked, I mentioned about 15, 16 days ago. And our ICU numbers probably peaked, you know, about 10 days ago as well. So, yeah, you know, we're heading in the right direction. Uh, we've taken a, a, a good step forward in protecting our acute care system and alleviating some of the stress strains on it. Not to say they're not busy. They're busy. They're strained. Uh, I understand that. But we're definitely heading in the right direction for sure. From the Brandon Sun, Karen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just a little bit more on restrictions. Um, with so many uh, provinces lifting restrictions, including ours, uh, there's been a, a bit of a call for maybe if we ever need restrictions again to give them a serious rethink because there's been a lot of questions over what worked and what didn't. 
and uh, also some of the harms that they did. Uh, so uh, going forward, uh, especially as we're trending down, uh, are you rethinking any restrictions if they're ever needed again? So first, I think we have to transition out of the restrictions we're in. I, I think everything that public health has been involved with, uh, you know, everything that we did from a, uh, a system standpoint, even acute care system, not just public health, I think we're going to have to reflect back and look at what we did, uh, what we did well, what we didn't do well, and learn those lessons and learn lessons from other jurisdictions as well. Public health never wanted restrictions on people. You know, we put, we had to put restrictions and orders in place to mitigate the risk, to help reduce the impacts of the original COVID uh, um, uh, strain that was here in relation to morbidity, in relation to mortality, and an overwhelming of the acute care system. Uh, and those restrictions were in place because of that. Now the virus has changed quite substantially and the risk from the virus has you know changed quite drastically as well coupled with our vaccine uptake that is 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 amazing in Manitoba when you look at the amount of Manitobans that stepped up for a vaccine it helps prevent issues from happening uh, um, so so I you know I think going forward again we have to get out of what we're in right now and then we'll have to look at what to do in the future working with those other systems as well I mean, right now we have restrictions to protect our healthcare system. And I think going forward, we're going to have to look at the parameters of that and make sure we don't cause other harms. Because as we've said all along, restrictions cause harms. We need to be cognizant of that. And we were cognizant of it. But the harms related to death and mortality, morbidity, and overwhelming of the acute care system with, with COVID-19 was real. And that would cause a lot more harm at that time. So now that because the virus has changed, our approach is changing as well because that risk is different right now as well. Thanks for that. And uh, just um, piggybacking on this. Yeah, after this, um, is the province uh, considering any kind of a plan to uh, uh, maybe increase capacity in the healthcare system altogether, uh, especially in terms of things, you know, like reinvesting in cash uh, and also maybe upgrading certain systems so we have uh, so we uh, have the capacity in case there's ever another uh, pandemic or serious health crisis? So, I mean, a lot more could be answered through shared health in relation to that. I've been in practice since 2002. You know, the system was busy back then. The system at times, especially in the winter time, they're on, they, they were, they were ex, you know, extremely, really busy. We were almost overwhelmed uh, back then. And we've had issues related to system capacity for many, many years. This is something that isn't new. It's not just our jurisdiction. It's every jurisdiction out there. Uh, even jurisdictions in the states where you have private health care and they have five or 10 times their, our acute care capacity, they felt strained. And they still had to put in some of these other measures as well. So 10 times our capacity and they still had problems. So that has to be considered as well. So I think throughout the pandemic, the system has tried to build capacity, has built capacity, and that's going to be a priority going forward. Uh, it has to be a priority. Public health is really going to have that priority as well, because that acute care system capacity is that rate limiting step. It's not about hospital beds either. It is about personnel and creating some efficiencies as well. So again, I, you know, I think Shared Health it has, has been working on this and they're going to continue to work on it. And I think you know, we'll all continue to work on that and strive to build that acute care capacity as much as possible. Thank you, doctor. We have time for a few more questions. Media, please proceed. Uh, there, um, we, we had the Premier of Alberta mentioning that proof of vaccination would be, you know, the first restriction to go. In, in Manitoba, do, do we know what's perhaps the, the last restriction that would go? So again, we're going through this process right now. I, I think first we have to bring capacities back up to 100% and then we'd have to take those next steps there afterwards. So, you know, it's again, it's hard to predict that future. We'll have to take a look at that evidence, uh, uh, but it won't be the first thing to go at the present time. We're not recommended from public health, uh, but might be coupled with some other things going forward as well. Again, you know, we're, we're reviewing the data, we're reviewing the evidence, we're reviewing what's happening in Manitoba and looking at those indicators. And we we make decisions, we will provide those recommendations and decisions to, to, to everyone. Dr. Dr. Allen, could you, ex sorry, could you just expand quickly on what you mean by capacity has to come back up to 100%? 
Well, right now there are some restrictions in place at 50% capacity, right? So, so those capacities, uh, you know, should go back up to 100%. So there are still restrictions in place on capacity in different venues. Uh, so I was just using that as an example. Dr. Reimer, uh, could you give me kind of a your feeling on the uptake of vaccines uh, among the youngest Manitobans who are eligible? Obviously, that age group is um, you know the lowest, just because it's been the least amount of time that they've been able to get one. But uh, is this what you had expected? Is it a little lower, a little higher? Well, when we first looked at surveys early in the pandemic, um, we saw that you know maybe 50% of parents were planning to immunize their their kids and and that 50% number even as we went later into the pandemic um it it went up somewhat for um youth overall uh, but the youngest age groups those, those surveys still showed us around 50%. So we're closing in on 60% in Manitoba. So I would say you know in some ways we're extremely happy to see the numbers as high as they are and and so thankful to uh, every parent who brought their child in uh, to increase the protection for their child for their classmates, the schools, their families. Um but we still know that you know over 40% of kids age 5 to 11 have not had a dose yet. And so uh, we want to get children protected to prevent them from ending up in the hospital, ending up in the ICU. You know, I don't want to have any kids go through that. I don't want to have any parents have to go through that. So we still want to see those numbers go higher, even while we're, we're really celebrating um, how many kids have gotten that first layer of protection. I do expect there'll be a bit of a delay now in uptake because some of those kids have had a recent infection, and especially with the NACI guidance to wait two to three months after an infection before the next dose, uh, we may see more of a delay before the numbers start again to rise. Um, but I don't think that that reflects hesitancy necessarily in the population, but more just their desire to follow uh, NACI guidance as much as they can. Dr. Atwell, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly um, in your answer about testing because my audio was cutting out here, but the I, I think that you said that rapid tests might be the, the preferred method and, and you said the province is moving to a testing and treating approach. So if that's the case, wh why not make it a little bit easier for people to get their hands on rapid tests? Why, why do we still have people going to testing sites to be able to pick them up? Why not expand wider access to those rapid antigen tests? So when we have a testing strategy, I never said one was preferable to another. One might be easier in certain locations in Manitoba compared to other locations. Testing is widely available. Again, if you, know, if you are uh, symptomatic, uh, go get tested, especially if you are at a higher risk category where you can look at that treatment. And that testing strategy will continue to be refined as well. And, and you know, in relation to uh, rapid antigen tests, I mean, there are supply and demand issues here. So the supply is an issue and I know work is being done on that. I don't have all the details of uh, our supply right now. Uh, I didn't have it for this call here, but you know, things are being worked on in relation to uh, our testing strategy going forward. And again, you know, once we, we have more announcements to make, we will provide that to the public. Dr. Reimer, there's a, a news story today about uh, students at a school in Winnipeg being harassed uh, to take off their masks to, to not get vaccinated. Uh, a, I guess I'm hoping for your reaction to that. And, and further to that, have you been hearing of this instance at, have you been hearing about this at any other uh, school vaccination clinic? Yes, yeah, so I, I saw the, that story as well in the news this morning. And um, obviously, we, we don't want children to feel unsafe at school. It's, it's really critical that kids are able to go to school and participate in learning, but also in the recreational parts of school to have outdoor recess. So we want to protect kids um, in, in every opportunity and um, really don't want them to become part of um, the debate and part of um, what's going on with the protests. So um, certainly disheartened to see that, but I'm not aware of any of our other vaccine clinics being targeted um, or any plans uh, for protesters to come to those clinics. Um, but certainly we do have security teams who are monitoring at all times and, uh, and making sure that things are safe for people to come to the clinics, whether they're in a school or one of our um, uh, stable sites like the convention center, for example, uh, we do have that security process in place. 
Dr. Atwell, I know you've spoken uh, about the protests outside the legislature a couple of times in this briefing. Um, there are some plans for some of these people or perhaps a different group um, to walk into a Winnipeg mall in the coming days, uh, maskless, uh, I assume, contravening public health orders. That's a bit of a change considering uh, that most of the public health orders in place are being followed, although other laws are being broken outside the legislature right now. What would you say to people who uh, may be planning to join in on that? No, I, I think we have to look at exactly why are these protesters protesting? I think that's question number one. Uh, and number two is let's look at what everyone's done. I think everyone has made some sacrifices. I could understand some people are frustrated. I think we're all frustrated to some degree. Uh, you know, people who have followed the restrictions that limited their interactions with friends and family. I know we've caused some uh, um, divides in society as well, but this has to do with everyone's ability to access health care. Uh, you know, to access uh, a doctor or a nurse or, you know, to access uh, um, life-saving care when it's required, whether you were vaccinated or not, whether you followed the orders or not. Uh, you know, everyone accesses these places for their care, including those who protest. We've seen lots of stories of protesters who are protesting and all of a sudden they need care. And the same people that they're protesting against almost are caring for them. So I, I, th I, think, I think let's focus on what people have done. Let's focus on all the Manitobans who have done what we've asked them to do to put ourselves in a position where we're lessening those restrictions and we're gonna lessen them as quickly as possible. Let's focus on those Manitobans. I, I think that's what we need to do from a societal perspective as well. We need to acknowledge the harms that have been caused and that likely will continue to be caused for the short term here. We should acknowledge people's right to voice an opinion and to protest, but you shouldn't harm other people when you do that. There are ways to do it both legally and morally. And I, I would expect, or I would ask that these individuals think about that before they go out and perhaps harm someone. Time for a couple more questions. Uh, actually, this one's for Dr. Rager. I just wanted to know if she could elaborate a little bit more on the uh, Novavax and uh, why she, and uh, why she uh, thinks it's uh, probably going to uh, have a, greater uptake or people will accept it more. Yeah, so Novavax uh, has not yet been approved by Health Canada, but they have submitted an application to Health Canada. So I don't know that they will be approved. That's, that's a really critical step that Health Canada ensure that uh, all of the safety and effectiveness data supporting the vaccine are in place. But if it is approved, um, one of the things that may help some people who have reservations around the new technology is the fact that it's a protein subunit vaccine. And protein subunit meaning it contains you know, a very small piece of virus, basically the spike protein in it, and so triggers the immune system by using that small piece of virus, similar to how most uh, many vaccines in the past have also worked. So we have uh, other vaccines that either use the whole virus that's alive but weakened or um, a dead version of the whole virus or sometimes chopping up the virus into little pieces and, and only presenting part of it. So this may be something that's more familiar to people because it's not using the messenger RNA technology. We're not saying uh, that it's better or worse than the messenger RNA technology, only that uh, for people who continue to feel concerned about the new technology that this might be more comfortable for them because it's more similar to vaccines they may have received in the past. Uh, any, any reconsideration to, um, sorry, um, you know, a few weeks back, we heard that there was no plans to uh, change the definition for who is considered fully vaccinated. Uh, is there is there any consideration now about perhaps uh, updating that definition? Uh, no, at the present time, there's no uh, no changes in relation to what you're speaking to, or what the yeah in relation to um, uh, who's duly vaxxed or not. Thank you, doctors. Thanks, everyone. This concludes our session.